Welcome to 502 Sessions. I'm Brian Kirby. My guest today is Max Acri. Max is a trombonist currently living in Boston, but he has performed, taught, and recorded at the international level. In 2012, he was awarded a Downbeat Undergraduate Soloist Award, and he went on tour in France with the Bill Carruthers Group. In 2014, he received a full scholarship to Berklee College of Music, and he recorded as soloist on an album with Jerry Berganzi and George Garzon, featuring the music of Nando Michelin. In 2017, he was the main guest artist at the Club de Trombone annual improvisation seminar held in Buenos Aires, where he spent a week presenting his ideas on improvisation in clinic and also performing at various clubs throughout the city. Max is joined today by Zach Auslander on guitar, Sozo Gelavani on bass, and Willis Edmondson on drums. Max Acri. <laughs> Thank you. 
502 Sessions. I'm here with Max Acri. Acri, right? Yes, sir. Good. All right. So, 502 Sessions with Max Acri. Good to have you here. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're welcome. So, the quartet, do you always work with a quartet? Uh, pretty much. I, I've used this quartet for the past uh, year or so uh, in this configuration with uh, Zach Soso and Willis. Okay. And so, your songs are heavily improvisation based. Uh, yeah, yeah, you Which could I'm absolutely say that. They, they have a, the statement there, yes. <laughs> they, they have a lot of um, framework for the, the players to really go wild. All right, uh, actually, I've jumped way ahead. Let's start, let's okay. just back up a little bit. Max Acri, so, so where are you from, actually? Uh, I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, originally. Okay. Um, my dad was a, a trombonist in the, in the scene there, a professional jazz trombonist, and uh, he inspired me to take up the horn. Oh, okay, I was going to say, how do you end up with trombone? So your dad, that helps quite a bit, and... When, did you go to public school there? I, I went to a, a private school for elementary school, a private Catholic school, but then um, when high school came around, I went to the School for Creative and Performing Arts, which is in oh. downtown Cincinnati. And when you went there, that's where you, so you didn't go through a public school music program, you took it to the performing arts program. So when you were in the Catholic school, did they do trombone, or was there much music? No, uh, well, <laughs> how I wound up with trombone is really funny, actually. Um, my eighth grade year, there was like a requirement, you either had to be in chorus or band, and I, I, I was not about to sing. No, so. <laughs> we had to do both, I think. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I talked to my dad about starting something, and he was like, well, you know, I have a trombone you can use. That's, that's no money for us, so I started on trombone. That was it? Yeah, that, that was it. Um, you know, I mean, I'd also heard my dad play a lot as a kid. He would take out the horn occasionally and play for me, and always a big inspiration. So, so wait, but he was a professional trombonist in, the, in, a, in a big band or the jazz music? Uh, yeah, well, my dad played um, lead on the Tommy Dorsey Ghost Band uh, in the 80s, and then eventually he made his living as a trombonist in Cincinnati playing uh, Broadway shows and big bands and society music-type gigs. Okay, so freelancer. Exactly, yeah. Um, so then you took it, so you go from elementary school to the performing arts school, which I assume was audition in, or you, it was... Yeah, you had to, it was, um, it was still technically part of the Cincinnati public school system, but uh, it was, uh, it did have an audition requirement to get in. And uh, I started trombone in eighth grade. I'd been playing about six months at that point, but... Oh, no kidding. I, uh, I guess I had a natural knack for it, and I was able to get in and secure a spot in the first trombone position in Symphonic Winds. Well, plus they probably also need trombones. Those, those yeah, middle horns yeah. for the orchestras. I'm assuming that you did a variety of uh, performance there, not just jazz. It was orchestra. Exactly, yeah. And I mean, they need horns. It like was that. for uh, Symphonic Winds, uh, orchestral literature, and then also for jazz. Okay. Uh, playing in the big band. And that was from... Eighth grade through high school? Uh, yeah, ninth, ninth grade through twelfth grade. I, I went to the School for Creative and Performing Arts from 2006 until 2010. It's a big step from high school to college, though. And you didn't make the step immediately, right? Uh, because, or did you do something before Berkeley? I did. I, I started my college career at the, um, the College Conservatory of Music, which is attached oh, okay. to... So you uh, did go from high school right to music? Yeah, I did. Um, I, I was a transfer uh, to Berkeley, actually. Um, my uh, long story short, my father passed away of cancer uh, oh, I'm after, sorry, yeah. after my, uh, my freshman year in college, and life circumstances kind of led me to, to leave the city. But um, I started my first year as an actual classical trombone performance major at CCM and uh, was doing um, Philharmonia there and just playing orchestral literature. Um, I've always wanted to play jazz, but you know my foundation is in classical. I feel like it's really helped me develop a good technique for the horn. You won an undergraduate downbeat soloist award. I did. I'm assuming that'd be jazz because downbeat's a jazz magazine, correct? It, did, it was. It was for jazz. Um, while I was at CCM, I was doing uh, the Philharmonia and all of the orchestral stuff, Symphonic Winds. But then I was also in the the big band. I was also part of a, a combo uh, that was directed by Kim Pencil who's a teacher on faculty there that I, I really admired a lot. So I was doing a lot of things back then. I would say so. So, yeah, because you were doing the classical thing, but also the jazz. Yeah, so, classical was just my, uh, my technical major, you know. Oh, okay. Yeah, but anyone can, you know, play in the jazz realm if they can improvise and if they can read. Okay. And then, so then you got your undergraduate degree. How do you get to tour in France? You did not graduate from Cincinnati. I did not. No, I'm, I'm actually just getting my degree this semester from Berkeley and finally, finally finishing up. Um, the, the tour with Bill Carruthers actually came from uh, my recognition by Downbeat. Oh. And um, he was doing this uh, tour, which was commemorating the 70th anniversary of the D-Day landings in Normandy. And um, at the time, I was a, a trombonist who 
I had a degree of repute for being able to do the, the ballad style uh, very well, sort of like Tommy Dorsey and Irby Green. And uh, he brought me on in particular to really uh, use that style. How long was the tour? Uh, I was in France uh, for three weeks okay. uh, at the time. And then, that, so that was 2012. How did you end up at Berkeley? Oh, that, uh, with Bill, that was in 2014. 2014. Actually. Oh, I think I mixed those up then. Okay, so, so, 24, so you, at that time you had a full scholarship already to Berkeley, so you did the France tour and then you came back and started Berkeley? Exactly. And are you yeah, a yeah. trombone major, a performance major, a composition? Or? I'm a performance major at Berkeley. That's what I'm getting my uh, degree in. All right, and that's coming right up. You said this semester yep. you're finally yes, graduating? Yes, sir. So wait, it's 2018, so you did a standard four-year thing? Exactly, yeah. All right, now let's talk about the writing. So... Did, have you always written, or when you got into jazz, did you start with standards like most people? And yeah, I, I was very uh, traditional in my sort of introduction to jazz. You know, just playing standards, going to jam sessions, and everything. It wasn't really until I came to Berkeley until I uh, developed an interest in composing. A lot of that was through my my teacher Hal Crook, who uh, was one of my biggest inspirations in general. But he really got me sort of in the mindset uh, for that. Um, specifically in the mindset, like start writing your own stuff, or are you just inspired by his original compositions, if you understand my questions? No, I, I understand exactly what you mean. I think it was a degree of both. Uh, also, in, He said, uh, man, write your own stuff. Yeah. Yeah, he, he wanted me to really try to get out and you know, write stuff that was going to supplement my own style in, uh, in a way that you know, standards wouldn't. Um, but also another inspiration was uh, Eric Dolphy. I always loved his writing and playing, and I wanted to write something that was sort of in that vein, but not, you know, completely just a rip-off. Okay, you're taking us back to the 60s here, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Dolphy died in 64, but way, way ahead of his time. And so um, that was just part of your listening? You, you, you discovered Eric Dolphy at Berkeley through, like, a history course, or you'd always been interested in that sound? So um, we should kind of explain that I've had many jazz bands on and some of them write, I wouldn't, they're not standards, but they're, um, they're based on a more standard layout. Exactly. Um, you've been here now, you're here now, I'm sorry, Daniel Rodham was here, and they're more, um, you have a lead sheet, but it's pretty open when you get to the improvisation mm -hmm. section. So I don't know, maybe you could, don't let me talk about it, let, I'll let you talk about what the difference is between a standard A, B, A form and... Yeah, that, I mean, that's a, that's a really interesting question. I think the biggest difference really is just the, how you negotiate the improvisation and how you negotiate the form. And sometimes the form that we play on the actual melody isn't the form that we play for the solos, or the solos might not have no, have, uh, have no form at all. You know, we'll play a head or a melody that I've composed, and then for the, uh, the solos, we're just playing free, which was um, a setting that I really explored a lot with Howe in his classes uh, at school. But also, um, a, a big inspiration for this is, it, it was influencing Dolphy too, and I know it's influenced how is like the 20th century classical music tradition as, you know, composed by guys like uh, Schoenberg and uh, Bella Bartok and Stravinsky. Um, a lot of the, the jazz, what would be considered the jazz avant-garde or, you know, modern jazz has been influenced by that idiom. So what are you, you've mentioned several artists there or composers as well, so what are you listening to? Uh, these over over like the last ten years, to ten years, man. That's well. A, I shouldn't say ten years, but you know, not right now. But you're mentioning them as influences, but you've also listened um, to most of their works, or not all of their works. I mean, uh, with Bartok, I'm I'm certainly an aficionado. Uh, okay. With, with Stravinsky, it's more of a thing. I, I really enjoy the Rite of Spring and Petrushka. That's a that's a great work, and I played the Firebird when I was, uh, the Firebird Suite, it's part of an opera, but it was, uh, or ballet, sorry, ballet, and it was condensed down to like a three movement piece for orchestra to perform, and uh, I did that while I was at CCM, which is also a, a great inspiration. So uh, yeah, those guys, uh, I like uh, Schoenberg, as I mentioned, uh, Pierre Lunaire, the first uh, piece he composed, is a atonal piece he composed is a really amazing. And when you speak about, um, you play the melody and maybe the free, or the improv section doesn't follow the form of the melody, you may have a, I didn't pay that close attention. I mean, I was listening, believe me. <laughs> but what I mean is I wasn't, oh, they, they did an 18 bar head and now that's, I think that's 20 bars. I, I wasn't paying, you know, I didn't do that. Yeah. So, but what you're saying is maybe the melody was 24 bars and the, but then when you improvise, it got stretched, so the changes would stretch. Exactly, yeah. Well, on the, on the first tune that we played, um, Excalibur. Excalibur. Um, uh, 
that actually doesn't have a form for the solos at all. So I that's have, free. Open. Yeah, it, it actually opens up with a rubato section. Uh, I, John Coltrane did this sort of on Love Supreme. Like in the very beginning, it's this extended rubato section, then it breaks into time, and then it goes to solos. And so, I mean, that was kind of a similar layout to the way that I envisioned uh, Excalibur. I have a, a, you know, kind of a drone while I play this melody, and then it breaks into time, and then it breaks into swing, and then we go into solos. So. It's kind of just a tangent after tangent. And let's talk about um, free improvisation, or did you have a different term for it? When no, I think that's a great term, actually. Open improvisation. So free sounds a little loose to people that don't listen that much, but there's a heavy component of listening involved there. Oh, absolutely. So I'll let you explain it, because um, I'm interviewing you. But So you're all listening. It's not You're not up here rambling on. So just talk about that. So. Well, from your perspective, my like uh, I've said before, one of my greatest inspirations is uh, Howe, who I studied, Howe Crook, who I studied with at school, and it was really his um, system of improvisation that influenced me the most. And the way that he kind of thought about it is that uh, it's um, it's an ensemble setting. You know, we're trying to be one unit that serves the music, and in that way, uh, we're always listening to each other. We're trying to do something that complements us as a whole rather than as individuals. And uh, I think, I mean, in, uh, in a nutshell, I think that's the, the way that I would describe free improvisation at its best. And your ears are highly attenuated to what's going on around you. Um, I'm making that as a statement, but it has to be true, <laughs> okay? <laughs> because it sounds like music. And so, but that's what I meant by, I mean, you're li you can hear individual changes in what Zozo is doing, which will influence you, but if you're soloing up front, he kind of hears what you're doing and can follow you. Yeah. It, it so you might even change key a little bit and they're up, it's up they get a, it, they're it, following the sound where it takes them. Exactly. Well, in a way, it becomes a super conducting loop, you know, like uh, what one does affects the other, affects the other, yeah, affects okay. the other. All right, great. We will talk more about um, Club de Trombone. Did I get that correct? Yep, that's right. Okay, we'll talk yeah. more about that later, but how about some more music now? Great. All right, let's bring your band back on. I'm sorry, let's bring your band back on. Max Acri is my guest today on 502 Sessions. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 
502 Sessions, I'm back with Max Acri, and let's talk about Club de Trombone Annual Improvisation Seminar of Buenos Aires. That is one long name. It is. It is very long. So why do they call it Club de Trombone? Is it all trombones, or people use trombones as clubs and they go around <laughs> raiding in the city or something? What's that all about? It, it's, a, it's a group of trombonists that all play professionally in the scene in uh, Buenos Aires doing you know jazz commercial type stuff. And uh, every year they try to bring in a person uh, to sort of give uh, lecture style uh, master classes on different topics that they're interested in. So um, they brought me in uh, last year. Um, I'm really lucky because Berkeley has a, a great connection to Argentina. And uh, one of my dear friends um, who I met at Berkeley, uh, a drummer named Juan Chiavasa, um, he sort of hooked me up uh, with this trombonist who was putting it together uh, last year in 2017 uh, named uh, Franco Espindola. And, uh, you know, through talking, he gradually is like, you want to come down? You know, uh, we would love to have you and, you know, have you play a few dates. You know, you can talk you know, master classes over the week and tell us about your, your concepts and everything. And it's just a great time. So how much organization did that take on your part? Or did you, was it a... It was a lot. Because yeah. you don't want to go in there and riff dialogue for an hour in a master class. And exactly, make up yeah. Stuff. I, I, had, I had a lot of notes, you know, uh, sort of saved on finale of, you know, different things that I had written out and how to approach certain things that I, that I took down there to them. Uh, we planned this over a year in advance. Oh. Because um, originally the you know the plan was for me to come down in 2016 actually, but we couldn't make it work out that year, so we had to you know delay it by a year, and uh, yeah, one of the greatest adventures I've ever gone on. Did you take your band down, or when you played the clubs, they had a rhythm section for you? Uh, yeah, they had a, a band for me. I, I played with a group that's um, sort of had, sort of famous in Buenos Aires, uh, the Hernan Merlo group. He plays with his son Fernan uh, Merlo, and uh, I can't Merlo. Yeah, Merlo. Their last name is uh, M-E-R-L-O. Oh, okay. And uh, so I played with them when I was going out and doing my club dates. And then when I was um, doing master classes, it was just me surrounded by like this massive group of like 40 trombonists. And did they have a student rhythm section for you? Uh, no, no. For that, it was just, it was more me just presenting, you know, like esoteric topics, you know, talking more than playing, I guess. All and right. I, I would demonstrate every once in a while to show them what I meant. And when you were playing um, throughout the city, did you, had you sent your music in advance or were you going down there as a jazz musician playing standards that are, you know, there's a common yeah. knowledge of among jazz musicians the world over. It, yeah, it was sort of uh, half and half. We, play, we played all of my original compositions that you I did. had at the time. And then we also were playing, because you know, we were doing like two hour sets, we were also playing some standards and ballads and everything. So what's next for Max Acree? You've done a lot. <laughs> I, I, I guess I it's all downhill from here, guys, so yeah. <laughs> just kidding. It's I'm all sorry. over. <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm kind of unsure. I, I really have a big passion for teaching, and I, oh. I, I want to try to continue that in any way that I can. Uh, Howe really inspired me, you know, uh, to be that way. Um, he's one of the most influential people in my life, and, uh, you know, he was just a teacher that I had at Berkeley, but he imparted so much wisdom on to me, and I, I really want to try to be that mentor-type figure for other people. It's one of the greatest aspirations of my life. So do you think um, private teaching or in a school setting, like ensembles and or all of it? I, I love it all. I love teaching an ensemble, but I also, you know, love teaching private students, even just in trombone, basic trombone technique. It's, uh, it's all great. I love doing all of that. And, but you're graduating with a performance degree, so yes, you sir. didn't think that you would go into like uh, public teaching, like a school yeah, or that, anything? Yeah, you know, that, that, that's right. It wasn't my plan originally when I started. Um, that sort of has come on in the last two years or so. So you can always supplement your performance degree with some kind of master's in education. So let's talk about that. So performance degree, you're also competent. Um, you can teach a theory class, you could uh, conducting, and... Yeah. It's not just trombone. No, yeah, there's I mean, that's a, your principal instrument, and you work a lot in improvisation and trombone, but... Exactly. There's a, well, I mean, there's a pretty thorough curriculum that we go through at Berkeley that's been, it's been set for, like, you know, 30, 40 years at this point. But, you know, there's, there's four harmony classes, and then there's also a tonal harmony requirements. So you study jazz harmony or commercial harmony, whatever you want to call it, and then you go back and you study, like, uh, the broken classical era. 
and you study uh, how to make like a uh, classical counterpoint and how to make canons. I well, think that that's what I did in school too. I think it was much easier in retrospect to learn the jazz stuff and then go back and do the figured bass. Exactly, yeah. The, if, if because then the figured bass, oh, it's like a chord progression. If, exactly. You know, I think it just happens to be whatever you start with is the easiest. Oh, maybe. For, and for me, you know, my dad was a jazz musician, so that, that was the type of harmony or at least the terminology that I was exposed to first. So going through tonal harmony was a, a bit of a chore, at least in being able to label things in the correct way. And, you know, you can't have parallel fifths. Yeah, yeah, all, I all remember that, taking that, that test and <laughs> you think you got it perfect and then, ooh, you moved to parallel fifths. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All those rules. Exactly, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty, um, pretty tight. But that's one of the... Um, I think my, my theory teacher at the time, I think he said, you know, get your figured bass down because it's one of the things that'll be on the graduate, to get into graduate school. They'll ask yeah. you about that. And sure enough, you know, and even if you don't, isn't perfect, at least you've got the competency. Because I guess, you know, it can be a little daunting. I think there's a lot of figured bass in classical theory, but I'm, I could be wrong on that. The, there, there is up until like the late Romantic era, and then when you get into the 20th century, you have guys that are pretty much rapidly starting to oh, throw, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. throw that out. But what I meant was when you're in school, the theory classes are kind of... Exactly, you know, yeah. Of for me, the hardest part was always remembering the seventh chord inversions, you know, like 6-4, 4-3, 4-2. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can't... All that stuff. I remember yeah. the numbers, but I can't quite recall the details. So, <laughs> All right. Max Acri is here on 502 Sessions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, how about one more song? Yeah, let's do it. One, two, one, two, one, two, three. Thank <laughs> you. 
All right, gentlemen, thank you for being here today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, you're welcome, you. you're welcome. Max Acri has been my guest today and his quartet uh, with Zach Oslander on guitar, Soso Gilavani on bass, and Willis Edmondson on drums. 502 Sessions is all about live original music, so if you're a musician and you have a lot of original material and you'd like to be on the show, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm at 502sessions at gmail.com. It doesn't have to be a quartet. You could be a solo, could be a quartet, could be a duo. I've had even an orchestra in here before. So don't hesitate to reach out. I check out all links and I respond to all emails. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.